And so we come to Easter. I think that this holiday brings up anxiety and maybe even some religious trauma for Unitarian Universalists. I wonder what meaning we can make out of this day and out of this story. Many of us have rejected the idea of a literal resurrection. We often have complicated feelings about Jesus. But we like the idea of a celebration of rebirth and renewal that coincides with the spring. We like the secular traditions of the Easter Bunny and dying eggs. But we are not a secular people. We are a people of faith. And so we want to celebrate something of this holiday, yet we remain unsure what exactly that is. At the heart of the Easter story is a nexus of questions about two major theological claims. One about the nature of Jesus and his identity, and the other about the question of salvation. In mainstream Christian theology, these two questions are considered mutually dependent. You can't answer one without answering the other. So in order for us to find our own meaning in this holiday, let's start with just a very quick review of that traditional Christian understanding. The most widespread Christian doctrine regarding these questions is substitutionary atonement. Yes. Yes, that old chestnut. <laughs> so in substitutionary atonement, this doctrine, Jesus is understood to be the human incarnation of God. And his death and resurrection are the means through which humanity is atoned. And from this doctrine comes the concept that Jesus died for your sins. The idea of substitutionary atonement was developed by St. Anselm of Canterbury during the early Middle Ages. It is a corollary of medieval law in which a serf who had offended a lord was required to make reparations. In medieval thought, humans were considered inherently sinful and therefore had to make atonement, but being inherently sinful could not make a worthy sacrifice. Therefore, God became human in order to make a perfect sacrifice on behalf of humanity. I can understand that this idea made a lot of sense at the time that it was developed. But it is just an idea, a human idea, developed hundreds of years after the life of Jesus in a completely different cultural context. It should not be upheld as the one and only way to make sense of the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus, especially for us. <coughs> As Unitarian Universalists, we belong to the living tradition, which means that we do not make a theological claim and then hold it for all time. Rather, we are encouraged to question theological claims as a means of developing our own beliefs. Our, our lack of doctrine does not mean that there is nothing supporting our faith. We are not bereft of theology in Unitarian Universalism. Rather, we are expected to do our own theological work and to come to our own conclusions in the company of others who think like us and do not think like us. That's why we have churches. In order for Easter to become theologically legible for us, we must develop our own theology of salvation. The first step of that journey is to ask, saved from what? What is it that we hope to be saved from? A traditional theology would tell us that we want to be saved from evil, that salvation is deliverance from evil. Well, okay then, well, what is evil? Rebecca Ann Parker, who was a prominent UU theologian, the former president of Star King School for the Ministry, defines evil as that which exploits the lives of some to benefit the lives of others. Evil is that which exploits the lives of some to benefit the lives of others. 
That means that we, as Unitarian Universalists, want the world to be saved from oppression. We imagine a world without poverty, without racism, ageism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, ableism, all other forms of oppression. For us, salvation is deliverance from these societal plagues. So given this understanding of evil and salvation, what sense can we make of this ancient story of Jesus' death and resurrection? I think there is a lot of value here. And of course, it is up for each of us to decide for ourselves, but I will put forth a few ideas for your consideration. First, we must ask ourselves, who was Jesus really? What are the facts that we have about him? This question is almost impossible to answer. Albert Schweitzer once said that to look for the historical Jesus is to look into a well and see your own reflection. But what do we know? Well, we know that he was a Jewish spiritual master who was executed by the Roman state when he was a young man. We know that he lived during a time of Roman occupation. He preached about a radical reversal of societal norms. In his vision for the world, the oppressed had value. The first would be last. We know that he wanted to move the Judaism of his time away from a focus on personal piety and towards a collective concern for those living at the margins. <coughs> Secondly, what value does a text that is full of supernatural phenomena have for the modern Unitarian Universalist reader? Well, we can start by letting go of the idea that the Gospels are meant to be a biographical text. They are not. We have to remember that the Bible was written in a certain time in a certain culture. And study of contemporaneous, contemporaneous literature suggests that miracle texts, including the resurrection, could be a literary device. Those stories were common in the ancient Near East. Think about what would happen if 2,000 years from now somebody discovered a digital file full of memes and hashtags. <laughs> what are the chances that they would really understand what those memes and hashtags meant and what we were trying to say in them? Very, very low. Likewise, there are layers upon layers of hidden cultural context that is found in the biblical text. We cannot take them at face value. Perhaps the point of this story is not about a literal resurrection at all, but the way that Jesus' teachings gained poignancy and popularity after his execution. In fact, because of his execution. And finally, please, I encourage you, I implore you, to drop all ideas that Jesus died for your sins. <laughs> that phrase has been used to harm and control people long enough. Let us be done with it. We once believed that the world was flat. If our scientific understanding of the world has grown up, perhaps it is time for our theological understanding to grow up as well. Jesus died because violence is the predictable outcome when somebody preaches about radical reversals of societal norms and goes around saying the first will be last. Jesus' ministry was to the people at the absolute margins of society. He spent his time with women, the disabled, children, the elderly, the sick, foreigners. He subverted the brutal occupation of the Romans. He even engaged in street theater, mocking the Romans. That's what Palm Sunday was. Of course they hated him. Of course they wanted to kill him. I submit to you, that Jesus did not die for your sins, but rather he died because he would not recant his teachings about a radical love that dissolved barriers of class and race. <laughs> and that is something that even the saltiest, most hardcore human can get behind, a humanist. <clears throat> That's something that all human beings can embrace. 
oppression, which we define as evil, has been part of the story of humanity from our beginning, and it will be with us through to our end. We will always find ways to exclude people. And so we come up with theologies of salvation because we want to break that cycle of pain and suffering. And that, that is the very heart of Jesus' ministry. The traditional Christian doctrine of salvation through the atonement of Jesus has its appeal because somebody else can fix it for us. But it lets us off the hook entirely too easily. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe that humans are ultimately responsible both for oppression and the healing of oppression. Of salvation, Rebecca Ann Parker writes, salvation comes through the gift of human powers and capacities to heal injury, to comfort the afflicted, to create justice, and to offer love. If evil is the exploitation of the lives of some to benefit the lives of others, then salvation is the healing of those relationships. Humans create oppression. Humans must work to end oppression. After all, atonement is just a rendering of the phrase at one end. Humanity is meant to be at one with each other, and when we are not, it is our responsibility to create at one end. We have many human guides for building at one end through loving, equitable relationships with other human beings. What could it mean to uphold Jesus of Nazareth as one such guide? among others. It's true that Jesus has been used as an instrument of control by factions of people who claim to follow him. Given the reality of his ministry, it is a great irony that the legacy of Jesus has been distorted into a means of violence and control. But Jesus' powerful message of radical love should not be lost because of this misuse. I think the time has come for liberal religion to reclaim the teaching of Jesus as a model for our work of salvation through the healing of oppression. For centuries, people have believed that they are saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Perhaps the time has come for the legacy of Jesus to be saved by people who are guided by their Unitarian logic and their Universalist love. This Easter tide, let us be an Easter people. Let us claim that title this year. Let us be a people of hope, a people <coughs> of joy, a people of life that renews itself through the healing power of love. Let us tell the story of Jesus, the carpenter's son. Jesus, the man who devoted his life to the oppressed, the man who gave hope to his people during a time of occupation, the man who preached about radical love to those living at the margins of society. There is power in that man's words. Let us reclaim them in our work to heal oppression for the salvation of ourselves and the salvation of this world. May it be so. Amen. Blessed be.